Welcome back to another episode of Pro Cuts. Today we are with Nathan Pavalchek, who is a member of the Chicago White Sox organization. Nasty Nate, what's up, man? Hey, how you doing? I'm good. Where are you right now? What level are you at? I know you just came out of Winthrop a year or so ago. So I played rookie advanced ball this year, and then um, my innings limit was way up there from Winthrop, so I was in rookie advanced the whole year, basically told, hey, you're not leaving, so. I'm hoping to move up this year, but hope I'm hoping more for baseball than anything. Okay, so uh, coming out of Pompano Beach, Florida, um, you played at Cardinal Gibbons High School, and when you yep. went into high school, you were a two-sport athlete, correct? So what? how did you end up just going the baseball route? Well, I played football for a year, like four Gibbons, and I just got pummeled. I played quarterback, and I had like – fractured bones in my foot, fractured bones in my hand. I got pummeled like every game. And then, so I like sat down with my dad one day, like the next fall and I was missing out on fall baseball. And I was like, I don't want to miss fall baseball again. And he was like, well then don't play football. And I was like, it wasn't that I didn't like football. It was just that I didn't want to miss baseball. So like, I just chose, Hey, I'm going to play baseball full time. Cause down here it's baseball the whole year it's not like you're just playing it in the spring so I was lucky enough where I could play like fall baseball for Gibbons go play spring baseball for Gibbons and then right into the summer with elite squad so it and was a, you were not you were not always a, a pitcher though right no I I didn't really pitch until truthfully probably like full-time I was like a PO guy kind of guy it was probably like my senior year I threw like 20 innings my junior summer or junior spring and then that's like my senior year is when I really like fell into pitching um it was mainly like the choice wasn't really made for me I I I didn't have a preference though either so I mean after my sophomore year I dislocated my left shoulder and I went to elite squad and Richie was like hey we want you to pitch and I couldn't swing a bat so and I turned out pretty good at it and stuck with it ever since. Um, okay, so you end up going to Winthrop and, and having a really nice career. And I think your uh, recruiting process, I think you did it really intelligently. So I kind of want to focus on that and then how that ended up working out for you at Winthrop. First of all, Winthrop is, is becoming more and more known nowadays uh, than yeah. it was when you committed there. Uh, which wasn't terribly long ago, but now with social media and with all the exposure and everything and kids mm -hmm. being able to move around, Winthrop is, is well known outside of just that immediate region. How did you end up at, at Winthrop? Because like, how, how did you even know it existed? Well, so there was a guy that played a year older than me for elite squad named Freddie Sultan, and he committed there. And like, naturally I'd see like the commitments on like Instagram and Twitter and like, I always wanted to be that guy. So I'd always look up the schools and be like, oh yeah, like this place has really nice facilities. Like, oh, the campus is super nice. And so when I looked up Winthrop, I was like blown away by like just the facilities they had for baseball. And I was like, I had never heard of this place. And uh, so I looked it up and then it was funny, like Freddie, I think committed there probably like the fall of my junior year, he was a senior and I looked I went to the elite squad tryout and their hitting coach came to watch and like gave me a call after. And I ended up visiting there probably, oh, I think it was December, or January of my junior year and then committed there after the summer was over. So. So you did a lot of research on schools just based off of what you saw on, on social media where other kids were going, you would see other kids and you'd say, okay, let me look into that school. Yeah, for sure. Like my my main priority, everyone, like I, I was a big academic guy, but at the end of the day, like I had a conversation with my dad and we were talking about it and I was like, I want to go somewhere with like nice baseball facilities. Like, cause at the end of the day, that's where I'm going to work every day, probably eight hours a day. So like, I want to go somewhere that I could take pride in that I really enjoyed going to every single day. So I'd look up the baseball facilities first and foremost. And then if they didn't have like nice ones, I was like, All right, I'm out. So did you reach out to the kid that you knew there and ask him about the program, obviously, right? 
Yeah. So I got, I texted Richie Palmer who runs elite squad for Freddie's number and like shot him a text after I had visited and like, Hey, how are the coaches? How do you like the school? What's the difference between like South Florida and like Rock Hill, South Carolina? Cause I had no idea where Rock Hill was, but I ended up finding out it's like right South of Charlotte. So the difference in lifestyle of having everything really close to you wasn't all that different. I, I love how, and this is, you know, this is a great story. And one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping kids can learn from this series, I love how proactive you are, right? Like you're going in, you're just seeing random commitments online and you're going and you're digging into those schools. You're finding, okay, do I have a connection to that school? Then you're going and finding, all right, I know a kid that I can get in touch with there, but now I got to go find his phone number. And then you're going yeah. to call that kid. I mean, this is all super proactive. Um, why so so what else was going on though i mean i'd imagine you had other offers without throwing any names of schools out there not that you care now you're gonna be the pros yeah. but what else was going on like you know committing when you did is fairly late on the timeline right yeah so i had started the process and said i forgot my first offer like sophomore year and the school had kind of rushed me into it and i wasn't ready to commit because it was the first school you know and I wanted to see what else was out there. It's not that I didn't like the school. It's just I wasn't ready to do it. So um, I actually got majority of my offers like after that sophomore, like in between my sophomore summer and my junior summer. And then some of them rolled in like junior summer during elite squad season. But majority of them were like in that like time frame. So my dad and I actually rolled up to – I think we we flew up to – I want to say it was Atlanta and we took the like this East coast trip from Atlanta to New York and stopped at a number of schools that like I had interest in and that had contacted me and Winthrop was actually one of them. And it was like January that I did this and Winthrop didn't even offer me then I had offers from other schools on these visits, but not them. And just to, so I could see the school. Cause at the end of the day, like I knew that pictures can tell one story and then, like seeing it in person can tell a whole different one. So I wanted to go see him. And so we took like a week long trip, him and I just up and down the East coast and ended up flying out of New York back to Florida. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a process. I just, I tried to keep an open mind with it and find a school that I felt I was going to be the most successful at and that I felt like it was home for me. Okay. And so Winter you wanted to, yeah, that I mean, that, this is such a great, you're doing the process so right, everything you're telling me. So you want to wait until senior year just because you want to make sure that you're making the right decision for you, both, yeah. you know, personally and socially, culturally, and then, you know, whatever, everything else that goes into it. You want to mature before you make a decision and really know who you are. Yeah. But in doing that, you're you're missing out on opportunities, No. There was a few, yeah, that I missed out on. Uh, probably some bigger schools that I could have gone to. But I, I wanted somebody that wanted me. Like, you know, like they didn't they didn't want a right-handed pitcher that threw 90 miles an hour. They wanted Nate Pavelczyk. So, like, Winthrop was funny. Like, they brought me in January and then offered me in July. And they were like, hey, like, this is where you we want you. And I trusted TR and I trusted Coach Chrysler, who was there at the time, who's now at NC State. And, like, those guys are great. I love them both. They're both are keys to getting me to where I am now. So I wanted to find the school that I felt I was going to be the happiest at. So if this big school offered me, I wasn't going off name. Like, I was going off who I wanted to be with and who I wanted to coach me and where I wanted to be. Was there – what was the dream school? Winthrop wasn't the dream school growing up. Oh, like, you, LSU, you didn't even know down. about it in sixth, seventh, eighth grade. What was the dream school? LSU, without a question. It LSU. Like my, okay. my dad, my dad went to LSU. I'm still an LSU Tigers football fan. I can't root for like you know baseball and basketball, but like since Winthrop doesn't have a football team, I was you know I I could root for LSU football. I had decided, so in I stuck with them. Didn't you tell me – I thought you told me Notre Dame was up there for you also, right? Oh, yeah, no. LSU was the, the dream school, but realistically I was not playing there. Okay. I, I knew it. I, I, I wasn't if – I was if I had my mindset junior year of college 
as a senior in high school, maybe, but I physically and mentally was not ready to play at an LSU. How now, did you know that? Doesn't every kid believe they could do and play anywhere they want? How were you realistic in knowing that you weren't playing at LSU? I had talked to a lot of dudes, like elite squad that were older than me. And a lot of them had said like, and I see like all these guys transfer out of these big schools and they're phenomenal baseball players. And they're like, yeah, I was just never going to play. And I was like, yeah, I, I have never sat the bench in my life. I do not want to go somewhere and sit and then transfer out. So I wanted to go somewhere for four years. And, but Notre Dame was definitely up there. Like the history and being Catholic, like just, it, it was a good fit. I just couldn't get in. And so you couldn't get in and I'm going to, I'm going to, I think this is a really good story that you and I talked about. So I want to dig into yeah. just a little bit more. Um, you couldn't get in. The grades maybe weren't necessarily high enough, but the crazy thing was, is you were an outstanding student, right? So just yeah, tell me, I don't, what were your, let, let's go there first. What were your grades that did not get into Notre Dame? So my SAT got in, my ACT got in, my GPA got in, but, the uh what the, what's the word um class rank. my 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 class rank yeah. my class rank was too high i guess i was in like the 60s and they were like yeah we can't we can't take anybody in the 60s which givens you know like a bunch of smart kids and i had like a four 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 five at the time that this was going on so i was like how could i not get into notre dame and it was funny because ivy leagues were recruiting me at the time right so it's like if you would have gone to a another school that wasn't so high academic got those grades you would have been ranked higher in your class you would have ended up getting into Notre Dame because it was all more than likely yeah yeah okay so looking back on it I had asked you before I said would you have done anything different if you knew it was going to come down to class rank would you have worked harder to get into Notre Dame what was your answer I said no like I, I really did um I wouldn't tr have traded my experience in high school. I don't know if I would have been the baseball player I am today if I spent in two more hours studying for a chem two AP class, or instead of going out and throwing and hitting with my friends, like I still have the same friends that I had in high school. And, you know, I don't know if my path would have been the same if I wouldn't have dedicated myself to baseball as much as I had at the time. The, yeah. And that, that's, that's awesome. I talk about that with a lot of people like you can't be perfect at both and especially for parents like you can't expect your kid to be the straight a all honors all ap all everything and a great like there's just in the best baseball player like there's literally truly not enough hours in the day correct yeah there's not and not only that is you forgot the social aspect of it like can you want your kid to sit in the house all day and study and then there's only social hours to go play baseball, which baseball has been my escape since high school. And it's a great place to just go clear my mind and not worry about the world around me. But at the same time, you want to have friends. Like you want to go play golf with your friends for four hours on a Saturday. So, I mean, that's where I kind of just, that's why I don't regret anything that I did, you know? Yep. And so what was the social life? like for you who is now a professional in high school um you know i know where you grew up i knew the high school i know there was a lot of yeah. partying going on at that high school um i would assume it's natural for a high school kid to get involved in that did you to a certain degree you know i would it's not that i didn't go to parties it's just i didn't go to a lot of them and when i did i made smart decisions and I'm not that kind of guy, like even in college, like, you know, think people think college is like crazy parties and all the time, like majority of the time I was sitting around hanging out, watching a baseball game or a basketball game or football, whatever, whatever it may be at the time with my friends, just having casual conversation. I'm just not the big group party kind of guy, I guess. I would much rather go play golf on a Saturday or go fishing for six hours for no reason and just have a good time doing that. Did okay, so let's jump now to Winthrop, um, where you had a, a great career. You told me early in your time, though, you probably experienced your biggest challenge as a baseball player and really questioned whether or not you even wanted to play again. Take me through that part, yeah. So, freshman year, I mean, I got to college expecting it to be very similar to high school baseball, so. 
my mindset there, I did a lot of things proactively with recruiting and getting to know the school, but not actually what goes on. And I had thrown more my freshman year than I had ever thrown in my entire life. There, I took, I used to take like two days, three days off in high school and then go pitch. And it was no big deal to me at the time. But then you go to college and you're throwing six days a week with maybe one off day and your off day is still like a light toss at 90 feet. So, um, I got my freshman spring, I had like an 11 and a half ERA, like just brutal. I gave up like 30 walks in like 20 innings, not a lot of command, not a lot of moxie on the mound, you know, just kind of dreaded going out there at times. And to be honest, like that spring, like toward, especially towards the end, I was like, I don't even know if I want to come back next year. Like, I don't know if I'm going to play. I don't know if I'm actually good as I think I am. And Chrysler, our pitching coach, was like, all right, we're going to send you off to New Market, Virginia, in the middle of nowhere. And I ended up meeting this coach named Zach Cole, who's currently the pitching coach at College of Central Florida, the junior college powerhouse. And he really helped me just kind of transition from, like, this guy who thought that he was good, but now was kind of feeling like he wasn't that good to the guy that had the confidence back and had the moxie on the mound and not an overconfidence or a cockiness, but I believed in my stuff and I didn't have to worry about what other people thought of me. And he really helped me. I remember the one story that this was like my turning point was when he came out to like pull me from a game because I had walked two dudes. Like I walked, first and second on is like the eighth inning and I had two outs and he was like he was like all right Nate, I think we're gonna go to the bullpen here and I was like Zach like I got this guy and he was like you got him and I was like yeah I, I'm gonna throw him three sliders and I'm gonna sit him down and he was like okay and sure enough I threw three sliders sat him down walked back in and I really haven't looked back since that moment and like that that exact moment gave me the confidence that I've carried on and built up built upon to become the player I am today. Do you think that your stuff got any better or was it more of a, the mindset is what you needed to, to make better? I think my stuff got better, but not because of the reason that most people would think that I like worked harder with it. I think that I kind of kept the same process, but when I thought my stuff was bad, I tried to make it better instead of it just being natural and trusting it, which in turn made my stuff better. It wasn't that I was pulling with my front side and making it harder and making it break harder. It was just that I trusted it and let it work for me. And that made it better. And you said TR was a big part of, of this for you also, because he didn't, he didn't give up on you. Right. Oh, on, I mean, I could have came back that fall and regressed back to the guy I was, but he did never gave up hope in me. And like, even Walking into the fall, he was like, hey, Nate, you had a great summer. Like, so proud of you. Like, glad to see that you're back to who you we recruited. Like, I always I always believed in you, all this, you know, just encouraging me. And I ended up starting the fall as, like, rolling into the end of the fall. I was, like, our closer for the season. So that just says all you need to know. Like, I had an 11 and a half year already the year before. And he goes, all right, dude, we're going to give you the ball in the ninth inning in the biggest games and we're, I'm going to trust you to go get the outs. And did you, ended up, did you yeah, know, it was that part of your, did you know that about him or is that part of the research you did? And one of the reasons you went there is because you felt like I'm picking the right coaches that will give me a fair shot. Or is that something that he surprised you with? kind of both like I, I trusted the guys I thought that they were really good people genuinely so like that's why I picked them but I had no idea like how genuinely caring they were about the player I, I mean about like the person not only the player like TR has helped countless players that I can remember during just my time there become a better person as much as they have player like so that's where he surprised me where like you know most coaches like you lose their trust it's hard to get it back and for him, like, it's like, it's one of those things where it's done and over with. We flushed it. Like, it's a new, it's a new you kind of thing. So what's crazy about that season, too, is I started as a closer and ended up being our Saturday starter for the rest of the year. 
Yeah. And like, it's just, probably my it's best season too. Good. Your story is such a good story for young recruits to listen to. Just the the research and how proactive you were in finding the right place and what it means to find the right place so that things go well. Because when you did get to that place, you failed, you struggled, you thought about quitting yeah. on baseball. But because you had done all the right things in the process, you picked the right people. And ultimately it was Tom Reginos and Clint Chrysler that sent you off to Zach Cole and came back and gave and trusted you and gave you that opportunity and yeah. saved your baseball career. It, but it all goes back to being smart with the process and putting yourself with the right people so that they can get you there. I mean, that, that is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you gotta, you, you wanna surround yourself with good people is at the end of the day. So for me, it was a process, but my process in almost everything I do, whether it be friends, coaches, you know, anybody really, I just wanna surround myself with good people. So I think TR does the same thing over at Winthrop. Like he brought in Robbie Monday and Austin Hill, who was my pitching coach my senior year, who's, who are two phenomenal people. And Rich Witten was one of the hitting coaches. And, you know, they're just good dudes. And that's what you want to look for. So it's tough to look back and regret anything or say you'd change anything because you've had a lot of success. But if you can go back to the recruiting process with as many things as you did right, what's something you think you could have done better? I think the one thing I could have done better is not like so many cut and dry emails. Like I used to just like copy and paste them and then send them to college coaches with a different name. And at the end of the day, like thinking back on it is – as I've said, like, I try to surround myself with good people that care. And I didn't think that it portrayed how much I genuinely cared about where I was going to go to school by just sending non-personal emails, like sending a personal email with like, Hey, I really like your facility because of X, Y, and Z, or I really like the program that you guys do because of X, Y, and Z would be, would have been better than just copy and paste in an email and then sending it to some college coach. Cause at the end of the day, like I'm wasting his time by doing that. Last question for you, because I do think it's for you, the best part of this story is that you found the right people, because those people yeah. are what helped you get past the hardest time in your career and make sure that you were successful. What is it that young guys should be looking for when you say they're good dudes? Like, what are the characteristics that make up the kind of coaches that you would, you would want your son to play for one day? I would just say genuine. Like, I believe in being sometimes brutally honest and if tr told me that i sucked the day before then i sucked like i i want to hear that i because i have learned how to fail so like if you tell me i sucked i can fix it but if you just don't tell me then how am i gonna fix anything you know so my biggest thing is just someone that's genuine like they're honest with who you are and who or who they are and who they want you to be and what they want you to be. So at the end of the day, like I would rather them tell me, Hey, you're going to throw six innings this entire spring or just not tell me. And then me sit there and wait to pitch, you know, that's just who I am. So finding genuine people that care about who your family is and who your friends are and what you do on the weekends and, who you hang out with, like, that's, that's the important things at the end of the day. Like you can be a baseball player, but at the end of the day, you're still a person. So finding a genuine person that cares about who you are is someone that I would say is a, would be a good coach for a good fit. Nathan Pavalchek, you are awesome, man. This was right, thank great. You. This was really, really great. Um, excellent story on how to do the process right and get yourself to the professional level. And I got a feeling uh, you're definitely not done working. So thank you so much for joining us today and telling your story for young guys to learn from. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to catch up.